All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to WCET's Price and Cost of Distance Learning Debate and Discussion Webinar. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Assistant Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. We have a wonderful presentation to get through today. As we go through, please make sure to enter any questions into the question box. We'll hold those toward the end of the presentation and then get to your questions. If we don't get to all of them, which I'm hoping there's quite a few because we have a small group, so it means lots of time for your Q&A. But if we don't get to those questions, we'll pull them out, share them with the presenters, and then provide written responses back to you. The webinar is being recorded, and the link to the recording and any resources that are shared will be available next week. That PowerPoint can be downloaded in the Handout tab as a PDF. Just click on the Handout, and then you can right-click on the document and follow along with us. We tend to have a pretty active Twitter discussion in the back channel. If you want to follow along, the hashtag is WCET Webcast. We have quite a bit to get through today. We'll do brief introductions of the presenters, go through the key report findings. We'll have a little discussion about whether or not distance ed should cost less. And Intims will chime in and say, well, it doesn't have to, and they'll walk us through a model. Then we'll get to the audience Q&A. Again, enter any questions into the question box. And our moderator today is Russ Poulin, who's the Director of Policy Analysis here at WCET. He coordinates all of our research efforts, edits the Frontiers blog, and is involved in numerous research projects on online learning and distance education. So please welcome Russ Poulin. Thank you, Megan, and thank you, everyone, who's joining us today. Uh, this work is a result of uh, efforts from our WCET steering committee that they had been hearing from, from members that there had been um, issues or pressures uh, uh, regarding the issues of the, the price and cost of distance education. really want to thank Joan Bullion, Tom Cavanaugh, and Preston Davis from the steering committee, and we are also helped from uh, helped by John John Opper uh, from the Florida Virtual Campus, who uh, uh, helped us out in terms of uh, thinking this through and what sort of work we should be doing and how the questions should work. This is an update uh, of some of some uh, old questions that we had done a few years ago, uh, but expanded on that work and wanted to make sure that we provided uh, different views uh, on, on different sides because there's different opinions on these questions and uh, really want to provoke conversation uh, with all this and I think that we have we have done that. Now I'm going to turn to uh, introducing our panelists here today so we can go to the next slide uh, that I uh, want to uh, thank them for helping us here today and Sally Johnstone is the president of the National Center for Higher Education Management Systems and GEMS that's an organization known nationally and internationally for turning data into knowledge to support strategic decision-making at institutions and agencies of higher education. Prior to joining NCHEM, Sally served as a vice president at Western Governors University. She's also a provost at a public comprehensive university. And uh, we're excited that she was the founding executive director of WCET. And so we go, we go way back with Sally. Uh, and she's currently also serving as the founding editor of the Journal of Competency-Based Education and leads the new Foundation for Student Success. So thank you, Sally. And then uh, Reed Skull is Associate Dean of the Outreach School and Director of the Division of Outreach Credit Programs at the University of Wyoming. Uh, his division delivers approximately 35 degree and certificate programs and enrolls 8,000 students per semester in Wyoming and beyond. Previously, Reed served as coordinator of academic programs at University of Nevada, Reno, College of Extended Studies. And as you can see there, budgets are so bad in Wyoming that they can no longer afford color photography. <laughs> I'll next go to uh, Terry Strout. Uh, when I first met Terry, she was the founding director of CU Online, the University of Colorado's virtual campus initiative. CU Online was founded in 1996 and continues to be a leader in the development of curriculum and campus services provided on the web. 
Uh, Terry went to serve on, went on to serve as director of customer and provider relations at Western Governors Universities back when they were getting started. And more recently, Terry has been doing a lot of work with us on our distance education report, analyzing IPEDS distance education data and industry trends, and is also working with us on state authorization network issues, and she was a, um, a, a co-author on this report. With that, as co-author, I'm going to turn it to Terry to give us some background on this report. So thank you, Terry. Great. Thank you so much, Russ. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm pleased to be here. And as we said before, we really um, want to kind of get through the, the basic information and leave lots of time for questions because what we found is this report has generated a lot of dialogue from the various stakeholders. So I want to um, just start, if you'd go to the next slide, please, Megan, um, with basic definitions. Um, so the price is the amount of money that is charged to the student for instruction. And these are the definitions that we used in the survey and the ones that we'll use as we discuss this today. So obviously, um, the components of those are tuition and fees. And we found great variety in um, how we get to the total price of, of fees and tuition. Cost is the amount of money that is spent by the institution to create, offer, and support the instruction. And then the other definition, just to be clear about, since it's a little confusing in our industry, is um, the distance education definition. We generally um, use the Babson Survey Research Group, um, OLC, um, definition of 80% or more of the course being taught at a distance. So before I display um, the findings on price and costs at a high level, um, let's do a quick poll here. And the, the poll question is this, is the total price, that is tuition and fees for distance education courses at your institution less than a face-to-face -face course, the same as a face-to-face -face course, or more than a face-to-face -face course? And so we'll ask you to um, make your vote because we want to compare this audience to the survey audience and see, see if we find that they're in alignment or not. We thought that would be an interesting way to do it. That's good. And then just a reminder that the uh, price here is the tuition and fees. So it's what the student would pay on this. So Megan, do we see them rolling in? Or you? Yeah, we're at about 61% participation. Hoping we can get up okay. a little more. Okay. okay. I just was how much we see coming in, whether we see we'll them We'll go ahead and close it. Okay. So, let's see. We have the same 47%. This is looking fairly similar to uh, our findings. If you would go to the next slide, Megan. So, 21, 47. So, the slide, there we go the next one with the graphs from the survey. So it looks like the same trend. Um, what we found um, in the survey was fairly surprising, uh, to me anyway, that there no difference in tuition was up at 75%. Um, but when you look at the total price, um, distance education is still um, costing more, you know, about 54%. So what we found is that lots of times the difference in the price is made up by fees, and there were all kinds of fees. Um, the other thing that I'd like to do is um, Russ put a link in the chat box that is available to everyone because we're going to go into the details of um, price and cost a little bit more. And so if you are at a computer and um, want to have the report handy, that would it would be a good time to kind of click into that link now. Okay, so let's go to the next slide, please. So now we're going to talk about cost. So again, do distance education courses at your institution cost less to produce than a face-to-face -face course, the same to produce as a face-to-face -face course, or more to produce than a face-to-face -face course? And, and again, yeah. the idea here is to um, 
be able to compare this to uh, what, what we found in the survey. You had something to add, Russ? Yeah, and then the cost, again, is, uh, is not only just to produce it, to offer it, and support it, all of those uh, costs that, that go in together to uh, take it from beginning, beginning to end. Right, not just course production, but through teaching and support. Absolutely. We're at about 47% participation, but I'm going to go ahead and push the results because there's a pretty clear outlier. Wow. 94% <laughs> um, report that it, it, it costs more to produce a, a distance ed course than a face-to-face -face course, and none say less. Okay, let's go to the um, survey results, if we might, Megan. Okay, so in the survey, we also didn't find a soul who said it costs less, um, but we it wasn't it wasn't as dramatic as it was here. So 57% said no difference, and about 43% said that it costs more. So when we we went pretty deep into this cost analysis, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time, but this is where I thought that having access to um, the report pages might be useful. And if you, I think it starts on page about 38. Um, if you go to the next one, Megan, um, what, what we found was out of something like 20 um, characteristics, uh, you know, it, it, it was things cost more. And I thought that at this level, it would be interesting to look at the things that cost more. So in terms of preparing the course, um, not a lot of surprise there. 63% um, are saying that the technology is involved, the LMS, the student information system, and the various teaching tools cost more. Um, things like state authorization uh, doesn't, doesn't really seem to um, have much of an impact. And then admissions and enrollment, um, you know, not too, not too much of a variable there. But let's look at teaching the course, if we might. And Terry, one thing about these categories is that we, we built on uh, uh, the NCHEMS uh, cost model that Sally will talk a little bit more, a little bit later on, and then, then our folks decided to add a few more categories onto this. So we were trying to work together with what they were doing, but these were categories we got from them. And I just think that it's going to be great to be able to benchmark this going forward, you know, if in five years we can see what the trends are. So again, not a lot of surprises here. Instructional design is, is you know, considered by many to cost more. Um, the creating the materials costs more. Um, and ADA compliance. So there weren't a lot of surprises here either. Let's look at the next one, which I believe is support. At, oh, I'm sorry, assessment. So this is assessing the student learning. Um, and not a lot of surprises, administering or proctoring assessments. I actually thought that it would be higher, um, but 58% are reporting that. And then, of course, the issue of student identity um, for assessments was fairly high. And finally, is supporting the learner would be the next one. OK. And here, um, again, not a lot of surprises. Faculty training was fairly high. Um, help desk, I thought that that might have been, you know, more distance learning. You know, the help desk used to be a big piece. I think maybe everybody's gotten that figured out, and maybe they're needing to support the LMS for on-campus learners anyway. Um, and academic advising, you know, pretty much the same. So that's a fair amount of detail, but I thought that as we really kind of tease out the elements of cost and price, it would be helpful to have that level of detail from the survey. So I guess the question comes back to, does it really have to cost more to create distance education? So I will turn it back to y'all and we'll have that conversation. Let's see, yes, yeah, and then uh, what we're going to, to do now is that we're going to hear a little bit from uh, Reed and from Sally, and then uh, Reed being somebody who has to uh, deal with both the costs and the price uh, uh, every day and the work that he's doing, that we'll have him give a little background about his thoughts about the survey and then also what his experiences are, and then we'll follow up with uh, 
Sally, who uh, has uh, uh, points of view from different places where, where she's worked or observed as well. So, Reed, let me turn it to you. Oh, great. Thank you, Russ. I appreciate it. Well, um, I'm coming from, um, you know, the University of Wyoming perspective. And as, I, as we mentioned earlier, we've got about, we're actually up now to about 45 degree and certificate programs and 9,000 enrollments. But, and we've, we've experienced some growth, not so much in recent years, but where we really started to look at cost, and the price of distance education was when we uh, switched our revenue share arrangement with uh, the academic colleges so that um, they could participate, they could see better their participation in the fruits of the distance education labors. And so in order to determine what an appropriate revenue share would be, um, we had to go along with our provost at the time, this is 2013, 2014, we had to go in and really look at our cost structure. And so um, we focused on three areas of cost or categories of cost, which um, direct, indirect costs, and reserves, where we found direct costs being things like um, technological staffing for um, interactive video courses or web, conf um, or web conference courses as they are now. Um, and also our learning management system was a significant uh, direct cost. Um, at the time we were paying per student for an LMS. Now it's a little bit different, but um, we looked at our indirect costs as well and the things that we have to have going regardless of how many uh, classes we have or how few. And we needed to have instructional designers and we had to have certain kinds of baseline student services so that we could say to our accreditors that we were trying to create a same or similar learning environment as it exists on the Laramie campus. So. Um, those are some examples of indirect costs. Some of the indirect costs that are that have come up in the past couple of years is our expenditures for a CRM um, that's linked to the distance enrollments and recruitments. Um, we're kind of struggling. Some of our some of our uh, costs have now turned into rev or now we see the possibilities of them being turned into revenue centers. Um, things like testing and test proctoring, um, which used to be kind of a per student cost, are, is now morphing into the possibility of uh, becoming a revenue generator if we partner with one of, a, um, one of the uh, vendors, the for-profit vendors. So uh, these categories are kind of fluid. Reserves are kind of hard to um, for a lot of our academic partners to understand, and it's been a point of controversy, tremendous uh, controversy, but sometimes we need to maintain equipment. Um, sometimes equipment breaks, particularly when we had um, our outreach video network, which is a really high, high, um, high standard uh, video conferencing system. Um, when it breaks, oh my gosh, the cost could be in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands to replace or fix a bridge. Um, sometimes even when we're using more desktop method oriented methods of delivery, there are um, breakdowns of, of desktop technologies that we end up uh, kind of cloud-based services that we have to fix. So when we started and analyzing all these three categories of cost, um, we came up with a determination that about 45 to 50 percent of our current uh, tuition at the time was um, represented the cost of delivering distance education, and around 40 to 50 percent was the cost to the academic departments to hire faculty. Um, and I should mention this is a really expensive cost model 
because at the University of Wyoming, at least up to this point, it might change, but um, the involvement of full-time faculty of the university teaching in those courses was an emphasis. And whether they're full professors or lecturers, full-time faculty were pushed to teach. And so that drove our costs up, uh, particularly for the colleges. Um, next slide, uh, please, Megan. Um, thanks. Um, a now, as I mentioned, the cost, the, the, the cost and the price issues, I think, have been increasingly controversial at our university. Um, price is especially controversial because we have he heavily subsidized tuition, um, subsidized by the state, and um, you all might be shocked to realize, I mean, if for undergraduate tuition, we're at $124 a credit hour. That's got to be the lowest in our neighborhood um, in the western region by a noticeable amount. Um, but the problem is it we may need to raise tuition in some cases um, because sometimes there's a kind of a vanity price effect where students that we're trying to recruit think there's less quality if the tuition is so low. They want to know what the catch is um, sometimes in asking about tuition. Um, so the university, particularly because of budget cuts now, is, is uh, that we're really investigating, you know, could we increase our tuition and our fees? If so, by how much? And I think in the coming months we'll get to a conclusion of our discussion on that. Um, the other thing is, is when you're dealing with costs and you talk about things like reserves, transparency and, and joint understanding is really key. Um, you have to maintain a, a continuing conversation with your academic partners about where the money goes and what it's used for. And I think we've really, really struggled with that in the outreach school. Um, I wanted to mention lastly that there's a pretty interesting study that is about to come out. There's a, a doctoral student and also a university administrator at New Mexico State University. Her name is Kimberly Rumford and she's about ready to defend her dissertation uh, that involves a four institutional four institution study of, um, of uh, tuition costs um, for, for the student and delivery costs for the university and how those compare and interact to um, incentivize academic programs um, and faculty to teach in distance education. Um, I think I could say at least, I don't want to uh, disrupt her research in any way, but uh, University of Wyoming is one of those four institutions, and that's how I know about this study. But I think it's possibly the only study of its kind uh, in terms of getting in depth into the financial systems of respective distance ed organizations. So um, you might want to check out online um, her last uh, thank you to Russ for uh, mentioning her full name, but um, if you have questions, I'm sure she wouldn't mind if you looked her up. She's a really uh, generous colleague. So um, that's all I have for now. I think hopefully I haven't gone on too long. So I'll stop there. Thanks a lot, and, uh, and thanks for that, that background. And, and, and you can look at the national statistics, but sometimes it's very helpful to hear a perspective of somebody who's, who's uh, really doing the work. And so with that, I'm going to turn to, to Sally and give uh, another perspective of, about uh, these issues. So Sally, I'll turn it to you. Thank you, Russ. Um, you know, the question was, should it cost more, uh, that is, distance education versus face-to-face? -face? And, and I think should is an interesting word there. Uh, and I think I think more about the notion of can distance education cost less than face-to-face -face and consequently be priced less 
And I would suggest, yes, it could. But I think it's terrifically important to put everything into context. If we step back a few decades, in the 1980s, higher ed institutions began for the very first time to have to pay attention to their costs after several decades of really tremendous growth. In the 60s and 70s, colleges and universities were being built and staff hired to try to accommodate a huge demand. Uh, and by the late 1980s, that had really dropped off. And, and that's sheer demographics. The baby boomers were slipping outside the typical ages for college going. But this was a time that colleges particularly began to be using adjunct faculty to serve in exactly the same kinds of roles as full-time, excuse me, <clears throat> full-time faculty literally to reduce their costs. So in the 1990s, technology came into the picture in a big way, and campuses were adopting distance education to increase enrollments and consequently increase their revenues. But mostly, and I say mostly, I'd say about 98%, just replicated their classroom model. So you have one faculty member doing everything and now reaching out to students who weren't physically in the same place, but frequently that was bargained or arranged that they would not have more students than they would have had in their classroom. Now, the WCET study, I think, affirms this notion. Uh, at an operational level, distance ed tends to cost more than the usual face-to-face -face operations, and that's in part because technology is added and faculty need instructional designers, as Reed mentioned, to help them create really good learning experiences. And we know the remote students need help. In the late 1990s, uh, we were asked, and this is WCET and NCHEMS at the time, to design an online university from scratch, taking into account what a good learning experience needs to be. And it was set up to use people differently. Western Governors University at the moment has over 80,000 full-time students and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I think almost, you know, I looked at the number recently, but all of their faculty are full-time, and there's quite a number of them to serve those students. But it runs on approximately uh, $6,000 a year for student tuition. And that's for as many courses as a student wants to take. Now, on all the typical higher education measures, it does very well. It has high retention rates for low-income students, very low default rates, uh, when you measure quality by external either licen licensure exams or other forms, they tend to the students and graduates of WGU tend to score higher than the national average. And the graduates typically see uh, substantial increases in their incomes. So by all measures, this can be done. In the first WCET cost study that Russ mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, which involved WCET and NCHEMS, they were looking at all the variables that went into what constituted the cost in a distance education kind of framework. And they concluded out of that there was really only one factor that determined the, the major costs of distance education. And that's the people. Who did what to support students? Now, I'll show you the latest model that NCHIMS has developed shortly, but I'm going to go ahead and, and leave that perspective for a moment and turn this back to Russ. Great, great. Thank you, Sally, for, uh, for doing that and uh, giving us some, some additional background on all of this. Now, one thing, another thing that we wanted uh, our, our friend Reed to do uh, was uh, to talk about, uh, he'd talk about that this is becoming a bit controversial. And in the paper that we have, uh, Russ Adkins, uh, thank you Russ, I saw that you were online with us today, that uh, Russ uh, wrote up about what's going on in Florida and, uh, and that there's been, this, this whole issue has been uh, reviewed by the legislature, there's been uh, 
two papers that have been done about the cost of distance education in higher education in Florida, and there's been a cap put on uh, distance education fees in that state because uh, uh, really a couple institutions just went wild with those fees and uh, uh, really brought 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 attention attention to all that. And so Russ wrote a really good good piece about uh, what was going on down there. One that we didn't cover very much was what was going on in Wyoming, and we thought we'd bring a new flavor to this uh, discussion today and have Reed talk a little bit about what's going on uh, uh, with the Wyoming Community Colleges. So Reed, let me turn it to you. Well, thank you, Russ. Um, yeah, so Wyoming has um, only one m a big university that uh, offers, uh, you know, the second two years of a degree and um, graduate degrees, and that's the University of Wyoming. That's the only one that's physically present in the state. Um, but we have uh, six community colleges, and they're substantially funded by local and regional um, sources. But about 25 percent um, of their funds, each community college funds, uh, come from the state and from a block grant that goes, I think, through the community college commission. And so um, there's there's been not a debate, but kind of an examination amongst community colleges about how to fairly distribute the block grant and not to distribute it equally. That would be the easy thing, is distribute it equally among six community colleges. But Wyoming's a really diverse state geographically and uh, climactically and uh, human-wise. It's a very diverse state. And so there's a need for different kinds of instructional approaches from college to college. And so the community colleges were able to work with the legislature and get a funding formula for the distribution of the uh, block grant to each college. And so they um, pretty much uh, put in a variety of different weights. I think it was about four or five different um, kind of calculators. Some of the classes, for example, if, if one institution had a lot of classes that were uh, geared to uh, heavy lab components, uh, perhaps they had, um, there's one college in the state that has a, a really strong um, agriculture technology program and has a farm just like University of Wyoming does. Um, so that's, that's really expensive and so that's factored in to how costs are distributed. There's one college that really has a strong distance education program and a lot of their instruction is delivered online. And so um, the debate came to what kind of a multiplier or calculator would be used for distance education. And it came out, interestingly enough, that the, the calculator is 80% of a face-to-face -face course. Um, we don't, I, I've been trying to look into this issue for a while, and I'm not sure that there was a study that backed this up. It's, there's some dispute about that, but um, needless to say, or, or nevertheless, a calculator for an institution that has a heavy complement of distance ed courses is going to find that they need to use this 0.8 calculator um, in order to get their fair dis you know, distribution of revenues. And so um, this is going to be taking effect for the next biennium. And I anticipate that this will be a further, there will be further discussion on the issue of this calculator and, how, and what the foundation of it is. Um, I talked a little bit with folks at the Community College Commission, and, and they weren't exactly clear about it. So I think it's going to be an issue that this cost of distance education as compared to face-to-face -face will be an issue in our state that we'll debate uh, in the edu higher ed community for a while. So that's, I hope I made that understandable. That's all I've got. So uh, 
we can move on after from that. There. Yeah, it, it, it is a uh, an interesting thing a, uh, uh, that they that they're putting on there. And I was up at the Wyoming Distance Education Consortium uh, a meeting, I guess, last summer, last fall, when they were talking about about that, and they were trying to figure out what to do about it. But it was uh, uh, it was an issue uh, in terms of uh, would it uh, take away the incentives to to do distance education. Uh, uh, you know, for for institutions and institutions were talking about that. I do. We do have a quick question before we go on to Sally about that. Uh, uh, wouldn't that eighty percent calculation penalize colleges offering distance learning courses? Have you heard anything like that, or your opinions on that, uh, Reed? Well, I'll I'll be happy to give my opinion, which is just my own. It's not the University of Wyoming's, but I do. I, I'm concerned about it because I don't. I don't think we could, at least from a Wyoming perspective, say the distance ed would uniformly cost less. I think it depends on the model of learning that you have and the involvement, as, as Sally alluded to. I think personnel costs are a huge driver of all higher education, and this is no less true, I think, for distance education. So. Um, I'm concerned that that is kind of laying out there in the policy environment, and I hope that um, you know distance educators in the state will have a chance to be at the table for further policy discussions. And I anticipate that they will, Russ, given that we have a pretty strong statewide group that you uh, talked about, WIDAC, the Wyoming Distance Education Consortium. I think this issue will will come up in uh, WIDAC conferences and discussions in the future. Well, great, great. Yeah, yeah, it's a really strong group, and there's always strength in, in working together and strength in numbers. And so if somebody in Wyoming or anywhere else wants to do a study about costing issues, I'm now going to turn to Sally. She has some, some tools for you that can help with that. So Sally, we'll turn it to you. Well, thank you again, Russ. Could I actually go back? To, well, we can just stay right there. That's fine. Um, the uh, thing that, that Reed was just mentioning about the model and how you decide what you're going to do uh, is becoming increasingly more important in higher education, whether we're talking about distance education or competency-based education or face-to-face -face education. And we're all under pressure in, in this uh, environment to assure that students are getting what they need out of the experience. And I think there's a tremendous shift from uh, business as usual in our campus environments to what makes sense for the value of uh, what students and the states are putting into higher ed. With that said, our latest uh, NCHEMS interactive cost modeling tool uh, was put together really at the request of a number of colleges and university leaders so that they could begin to figure out how they could plan for making things work. And it was originally designed as um, an aid to those leaders that were trying to sort out sustainability of competency-based education but we've played with it, and it's quite applicable when we talk about our issues here with distance ed. What we've learned in working with a number of presidents and chief business officers and chief academic officers with colleges around the country is that the, the leaders really do have more degrees of freedom than they usually think they do in deciding how they're going to manage and staff services for students, and that means both academic and non-academic. Now, regardless of what is done, um, you have to balance your costs and your revenues. And this is just the front page of the tool that you can get at the NCHEMS website if you so desire. Uh, and you can begin playing with it. There's, there's a number of everything that's in yellow, by the way, are all variables. And as you change them, it will begin to change other things. And the materials behind it get even more interesting. But whether you're designing an online or competency-based program, there's a few things that you've got to keep in mind. 
and the very first assumption is that you have to keep the quality of the student learning experience and the student outcomes very high. And could we go to the next slide? The next thing that's good to remember as you're trying to plan out how you're going to do this is that your course design activity costs are the same regardless of how many students use the course materials. So as you do that, you think about what are the tasks. You've got to design the course specs, develop learning materials, select them, um, collect data for improvement, then design and select assessments. And that's just a, a general framework of what it means to design a course. And very frequently, as, as I think Reed made very clear, in the area of distance ed or online education, we get very specific about this. And most of this is not broken down specifically in our usual face-to-face -face models. But I think we're going to see that changing over the next decade. Once you've figured out what the tasks are for the course design, recognizing those are fixed costs, regardless of how many students, whether you've got 10 students in a course or 500 students in a course, <clears throat> this is going to cost you the same amount. But the next thing you have to do is figure out who's going to do these things. So what kind of staffing are you using for the different pieces of this whole design process? Uh, are you using exclusively full-time faculty? Are there pieces of it that you could use less than full-time faculty? Or you use differently skilled individuals, like um, instructional designers and institutional researchers. Uh, certainly to do the data collection and then feed, back, feed that back for improvement, it may also involve administrators like a department chair or a dean. And there may also be parts of this that you can use students in terms of student labor, or you may choose to step outside of your current activities and actually move toward licensing uh, learning resources that go into uh, a course as it's being designed. Can we go to the next slide? The next thing that it's critical that you have to do is recognize that when you're delivering a course, the costs absolutely depend on enrollments, but it also depends on who does what. So you have to support the students, and I think Reed went through a nice um, a framework of some of the things that they found they were paying for in their distance ed um, roles or, or the distance ed activities and were able to uh, find other ways to do it or find partners and various things. But more and more of that is beginning to emerge. So the question again is, who's going to do helping students with tutoring? Who's going to grade and evaluate the assessments? Well, very probably the faculty. But is, is it the faculty that will monitor student engagement? Is it the faculty that will do the technical support? Well, we hope not. Although in the early days of this, that's who did do the technical support. So this whole framework of when you're actually delivering the program, you have to recognize as a is going to have a real effect on the number of enrollments that you have. When you play this out, you begin to see that you can make assumptions about how much of whose time is going to be doing which of the tasks. And it may be that you use your full-time faculty in the very first parts of the course design to develop the overall uh, framework of how this fits into the curriculum and what it is that students need to know. But in addition to that, you may find that you use uh, people who are paid at a lesser cost than your full-time full professor to fill in the gaps for that with the full-time full professor actually acting as the um, sort of oversight and supervisor of the whole process and obviously paying a very important role in quality assurance. Can we go to the next slide? 
if you want to download this tool, it is an open education resource, and it was actually developed with the help of the Lumina Foundation. But it is on the WCET, I'm sorry, the yeah, NCHIMS uh, website, and it's, it's at the bottom of that first page. So I would encourage you to go ahead and download it, enjoy playing with it, and let us know what you're learning. Back to you, Russ. Great, Sally. Great. Yes, and then we did have some questions about uh, uh, where to find that. But yes, if you go to nchems.org and go down to the bottom of the of the first page, it should be able to uh, be able to find that there. Good. Okay. So uh, let's see. Let's go ahead and go to go to some some questions that we had, and then uh, one of the questions uh, came came early on, and this had to do uh, probably. Uh, both with the survey that we did, but also maybe for the cost categories that you uh, uh, that you use, uh, Sally. And this had to do from uh, Janet Atkinson, who said that uh, where do stipends to faculty when creating the course? Where do those uh, those fit into the the costs? Would uh, uh, Terry, do you want to start with that? And uh, uh, anyone else would like to talk to that? Maybe Reed has some ideas too. But Terry, I'll turn to you. Yeah, well, and my uh, my experience with this, you know, goes back almost 20 years. But I would the stipends to faculty um, when we started CU Online at the University of Colorado, that was that was how we remunerated the t our faculty for their course development, and that was considered work for hire a long, long time ago, 1996. Um, so I would, I think that it would be in the course development bucket, um, and um, that's that's really that that was my experience. I'm sure people have used them, done it in other ways, but our experience was we did um, work for hire contracts and paid the stipends to create the the initial courses offered through CU Online. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, this is Reed. I I would mention. Um, Using the framework that I suggested that we used a couple of years ago, the notion of direct and indirect um, costs and reserves, I would probably put uh, stipends, and this is where we put them, in the direct costs of instruction because it it didn't ver it it wasn't the same cost across. You know, as we go, it was tied to a per class or per unit effort, and so um, for that reason, we applied it to the direct costs of instruction. I hope that helps somewhat. Sure. Let, let me ask you a question about that. Are, are we reaching a point where um, it's not making sense anymore to do? To do stipends, are we are we getting to the point where that that's part of the uh, the job, or we should be thinking differently about uh, about how we're uh, creating these courses? And so, Reed, let me start with you on that, and then see what Sally has to say. Well, thank you. I, I'd love to sink my teeth into that one because I do think <laughs> that um, in recent years it's become expected that faculty will teach through distance uh, delivery systems. And I think our, our new president and provost are really, uh, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but they seem to me to be determined to make sure that that's an expectation for all faculty so that it is. And I think that also what I'm seeing is that the new faculty that we are uh, getting to the university, and I sit on a lot of hiring committees for the various colleges to assess the distance ed orientations of different candidates, faculty candidates that come in. Um, most of most new faculty really have no qualms about teaching online or through web conferencing video or uh, teaching in hybrid or off-campus formats. So I've seen a lot of the resistance probably in the past three or four years just start to disappear dissipate, I should say. Okay. And, Sally, and what are you Russ, seeing? 
Yeah, let me, let me weigh in on that only in the sense that what we're seeing is across the country, different campuses are dealing with this differently. Uh, okay. Very typically, it's now starting to be built into the absolute expectation on hiring, even bargained into union contracts for faculty in some states. And again, the, the reality is that uh, almost no campus now does not have a learning management system, and those learning management systems uh, are typically being used not only on campus but off campus, and again, very frequently, uh, just as was the case in the early days of distance education, a number of courses that are offered to on-campus students will be offered in a distance education format. It's not expected that there will be somewhere other than at the campus, but it's a way in which the campus can facilitate uh, adjustments to students' work schedules and life demands, and that's true not only for adult learners, but also for 18 to 22-year-olds, the majority of whom at least are working part-time. So we're, we're seeing more and more expectations developing that that's just a regular part of business. Okay, and then and, and Marsha Banker, our good friend Marsha, hello Marsha, uh, asked sort of a similar question about how is workload defined for new for new course development. That kind of goes along with that, but it might be interesting that you worked in a uh, unionized state, Sally, and was curious if you could comment about workload and, 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 and maybe getting into uh, union union issues with this too and how we might deal with that. Well, there there aren't universal answers to any right, of it, and right. it's broken down campus by campus, and in states where there are centralized bargaining environments with faculty, it's bargained into the contract in terms of how that will work. Um, what, what we're seeing at NCHEMS now with the variety of projects that we're working on is business as usual is not going to survive very much longer. Um, even in states where the populations are rising, like California, Florida, or others, there's greater demand for more uh, citizens to have access, not just access, have um, success with some form of post-secondary activities and much more transparency on the part of how, how the institution itself operates, whether it's a public or a private, um, profit, nonprofit, I mean, the status is, is irrelevant. But what we're, again, uh, noticing is a tremendous desire for transparency with regard to costs and what students are getting for those costs. OK. Now, you're, now uh, in Wyoming, you're not in a unionized uh, uh, state or situation there. But, but had, how do you approach those issues in terms of uh, uh, workload? Mm -hmm. um, that's right. We, we don't have a unionized state here, but there still are considerable issues about workload as we get more financial pressures on the university. And we're in, right now we're in the midst of um, what is a declared fiscal crisis. It's something short of exigency. But you know, our state funding is really jeopardized by declining um, oil and gas revenues. So, this is putting more pressure on uh, faculty to, you know, generate, you know, revenue, generate enrollments, generate recruitment, and so uh, there's a lot of discussion right now about workload and whether, um, you know, extra teaching could be uh, put in a service category for promotion and tenure. Um, there's a lot of discussion about whether or not um, t if faculty should be teaching overloads, and if so, how does that impact their research um, agendas because they're held to account for their research, teaching, and service? Um, so it's I I think the old categories, as Sally has suggested, are are starting to go away, and people are questioning, um, you know, more often what is a legitimate faculty workload in it. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's new models that are beginning to emerge, I think, in discussions at our university. 
Oh yeah, I'll put out a link today about there was a article about uh, this is an issue that's coming up in several state legislators about the faculty workload issues. Uh, Sally, there's a question for you from our friend uh, Ron Lagan, uh, Quality Matters uh, person. So I'm he says that he's pleased with the inclusion of delivery costs in Enchem's formula, uh, but why aren't costs for the venue for campus-based courses uh, included? And he talks about. Uh, uh, heating, security, maintenance, classroom, you know, everything down to uh, uh, having all, all sorts of other recreational and dining facilities. Could you say a bit about that? Sure. Those are, those are costs that can be uh, plugged in, and uh, there are other models that do that. The uh, cost that we, or the costing model that we were dealing with was not really trying to compare what happens on campus which is when we'd include all of those different um, very real costs of maintaining a facility, but rather to look at what happens when you're uh, trying to figure out and staff and support really high quality online learning activities. So the only reason it's not in our model is that that's not what our model was designed to really do. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and I also remember when we did uh, work with uh, Dennis Jones and the original costing one that it was amazing uh, you, it, that you had talked about that the, the major cost factor was uh, the, pre the people and the faculty, and it was amazing how that outweighed the marginal cost so much of even all those buildings of having them. That, that by the time you amortize them, that they uh, it, it's it, you know the real cost to legislators, but they as you yeah. marginalize them out that it's hard to get to them so in, good. in fact Dennis Dennis uh, had over his desk for many years the saying it's the people stupid right. Whether that's <laughs> on campus or off if you're really trying to affect a financial model of a higher education institution we'll take one last one here and then we'll turn it back to to Megan to close this out but it, uh, Ken Fairbanks says it may seem minor but office hours for online faculty, it has been an interesting debate on campus and reduction in faculty usage as uh, distance learning grows. Uh, what comments do you have? Maybe we'll turn to uh, Reed with that and what, you, what you've run into. Well, um, thanks, Russ, and, and thanks for the question. Um, I think that um, faculty office hours have become considerably less onerous, I think, with the with the advent of web con quality web conferencing, faculty can have office hours, you know, at the request of, at the mutual agreement of a student and a faculty member uh, at their laptop, no matter where they're located. And so um, it does take time, and faculty are sensitive to the time uh, investments that they have to make, but the flexibility of that time and when and how it is spent has um, increased exponentially. So um, I think it's becoming less of a uh, less of an issue um, from the faculty that I talk with and uh, and interact with. With that, uh, we're going to leave that as the last word and want to thank uh, uh, Terry, Sally, and Reed uh, for all your help today. And I'm going to turn it back to Megan to close us out. Great. Thank you so much, Russ, and thank you to all the presenters. That was a, a lot of information. So do look up at the report that was mentioned. And if this is your first WCET webcast, do visit our website and learn a little bit more about us. We do webcasts at least once a month, and we post the link to all of the recordings on our website. So check back next week for a link to the recording, and you can also view previous webinars. Coming up soon, we have our Leadership Summit, Essential in Institutional Capacities to Lead Innovation in Salt Lake City, and the WCET Annual Meeting Call for Proposals is now open, so share your interesting ideas and practices with the WCET community. The Call for Proposals is open to anybody, whether you're from a member institution or not. Thank you to our WCET supporting members and our WCET annual sponsors. And again, thank you for being part of this discussion today.